Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Three Minute Thesis Competition for 2023. Let's give a round of applause to everyone for being here. This yes. I have some humble brags for this Three Minute Thesis Competition. I am going to be the Master of Ceremonies for this event. My name is Austin Kanaka, the Assistant Director of Mark. Oh, those are some snaps I heard that. Well, thank you from the peanut gallery. Wow. I wasn't expecting that. I only paid them twenty dollars to do those snaps. Hey, I'm the assistant director of marketing and communications within the graduate college, and I have the again the esteemed honor and pleasure of serving as the master of ceremonies for this championship competition. Some statistics about the graduate college: we are proud of our 98 master's programs, 31 doctoral programs, and five specialist degrees. Each of the competitors here are representing one of those fine graduate programs that we have here at the university. To give a little bit of a competition overview for those who have never been to a three-minute thesis competition before, the three-minute thesis, or the 3MT as it is colloquially known, is a research and communication uh, uh, research competition developed at the University of Queensland in Australia, the land down under, and the shrimp on the barbie. Also, the graduate students in this competition are currently conducting, and it challenges students to be able to coordinate all of that information to an audience of specialists and mostly non-specialists. More event details. We had 51 graduate students from Florida Atlantic compete in five preliminary rounds or heats that were earlier this week. And here we are at the championship. Let's give a round of applause for everyone. <laughs> and I can't believe that we are here at the championship. It's like, oh, someday we're going to have that championship. Well, here we are, ladies and gentlemen, here we are. A little bit more on the history of the three minute thesis. The first competition was held in 2008 with 160 higher degree by research uh, candidates competing. By 2009 and 2010, the uh, competition expanded beyond, uh, beyond Australia. And then more and more universities around the world started saying, hey, this is pretty cool. We want to do it too. Florida Atlantic adopted the 3MT officially in 2016. And this is the seventh version of the three-minute thesis that we've held since we started in 2016. Of course, something weird happened in 2020 that prevented us from getting together in person, and therefore the last three 3MTs, try saying that 20 times fast, were conducted fully online, which is wonderful, but I think it's even better that we're now back in person here again. I don't know about you, I would, yeah, let's give it up for us again. Let's be here. I mean, this is obviously a competition that allows our graduate students to really showcase what they're up to and to inform the community of some of the great things that are going on at Florida Atlantic. We're super proud of everyone for being here and plan to continue this competition annually indefinitely into the future. Let's go over some of the competition rules. This is defined in the program that you have in front of you, and it's also going to be displayed on the screen. But in general, these are the rules for all of our 3MT competitors. There will be a single PowerPoint slide, a static slide, meaning no animation, flash, or audio is permitted. A single static slide will be displayed as each competitor presents their research. No additional electronic media is allowed to be used. Only spoken word, by the way. We may have some talented singers, rappers, or performers amongst us, but we are only to speak as I am right now. Presentations are limited to three minutes, as you can probably garner from the title, three-minute thesis competition. And competitors are not allowed to exceed that three-minute mark. That's why we have a big countdown over there. Pretend like you don't see that audience, but our competitors are going to want to pay attention to that three-minute countdown. Also, presentations are to commence from the stage. Once the competitor gets up here, they begin when they are ready. So we're going to give a nice round of applause, but until that competitor starts their presentation, that countdown will not begin. You are in control, competitors. Once our judging panel has a final decision, the results are final. Now, a little bit more about the judging criteria. This is how our judges are being asked to evaluate each of our graduate student competitors. There are two components of the criteria for the judges. First is comprehension and content. And the second portion, the other 50%, is engagement and communication. The comprehension and content portion really focuses on providing a clear background and the significance of the research in question. The presentation should also clearly describe the research strategy or design and the results or findings of the research. Finally, in comprehension and content, the presentation should clearly describe the conclusions, outcomes, and impact of the research. 
When we look at the other half of the evaluative criteria, engagement communication, this has to do with the oration being delivered clearly in a language which is appropriate for a non-specialist audience. Also, the PowerPoint slide being displayed, displayed was well-defined and enhances the presentation, and the presenter conveys enthusiasm for their research and captured and maintained the audience's attention throughout. There is a scoring calibration that judges use using a Likert scale or a Likert scale uh, rank from one to seven, one being does not meet the requirements, and seven being outstanding and flawless. Those are the rules. Are we clear on the rules? I think so. Everyone's like, yes, the rules are very, very clear. Also, without a competition, uh, this competition could not be possible without the volunteers and the sponsors that have made this possible. I'd like to give most of these individuals are completely behind the scenes, but I'd like to give a huge round of applause for all of our volunteers and our sponsors for this event. Including but not limited to our Office of the President, the Provost Office, Dean of Students, FAU Foundation, all of the academic colleges, and many, many more. We also want to thank our public affairs team. Many of you were here to capture a lot of these moments, and also the student union team has done well. I'm going to stop there because I'm definitely going to leave somebody out, and I don't want to offend anybody, but it obviously has taken a village to make this possible. So thank you again to everyone for contributing your time, efforts, and donations to make this possible. I referenced that we have some esteemed, distinguished faculty judges that are going to be using that evaluative criteria aforementioned, and at this time I am going to introduce each of our distinguished judges. First, we have the president in the building, ladies and gentlemen. Let's give it up for our president, Dr. Stacey Baldwin. Dr. Stacey Baldwin is a longtime member of the FAU community. 30 years of experience in higher education administration. She is also a three-time OWL alumni and proud first-generation college graduate. Since 1991, Dr. Volnick has served the university in many leadership roles, most recently as Chief Operating Officer, in which she provided leadership and administrative oversight of university operations across Florida Atlantic's six campuses. She has overseen $300 million in capital projects, including the construction of two residence halls, the Schmidt Family Complex for Academic and Athletic Excellence, and the new K-12 Complex for A.D. Henderson and FAU High on the Boca Raton campus. Additionally, she has been involved in the successes of many special projects, including FAU Health, the Annual President's ALA, and the University Fiscal Task Force. Throughout Dr. Volnick's tenure, she has played a critical role in streamlining university operations, strengthening institutional partnerships, and increasing student successes. Once again, let's give it up for President Dr. Stacey Volnick. In addition, I have the honor of introducing our provost, Dr. Michelle Hawkins. Dr. Hawkins? Michelle Hawkins, who holds a Doctor of Philosophy and a Master of Social Work, is our intern provost. She was formerly the vice provost and assisted the provost with oversight of the Division of Academic Affairs and its administration, faculty, and staff members. She also acted as Chief Academic Officer in the absence of the provost. Dr. Hawkins previously served as the Associate Provost for Planning and Budget. Prior to assuming that role, she served as Associate Provost for Programs and Assessment. Dr. Hawkins served as a professor and director of the School of Social Work in the College for Design and Social Inquiry, now known as the College of Social Work in Criminal Justice. With more than 15 years of experience overseeing accredited programs that require strong assessment and sustained evaluation, her leadership was essential to the establishment of the Master of Social Work degree program at Florida Atlantic University. Let's give it up for our provost, Dr. Hawkins. your list right here, Dr. Larry Fairman, who is our Vice President of Student Affairs. <laughs> Larry Fairman serves as the Vice President for Student Affairs at Florida Atlantic University. In this role, he oversees all aspects of student life on campuses, which span three counties and serve close to 30,000 students. Prior to his current role, Dr. Fairman served as the Associate Vice President for Student Affairs and the Dean of Students, where he concentrated on removing barriers to student success 
while maintaining safe and welcoming environments through the processes of student conduct and conflict resolution. Dr. Fairman has extensive experiences in the management of student life facilities, including the student union, campus recreation, and university housing. In support of his operational facilities management roles, Dr. Fairman has a passion for advising student organizations, having served as a two-time advisor for the Florida Association of Residence Halls, as well as the Campus, campus Residence Hall Association. Dr. Fairman holds an associate graduate faculty appointment in the Department of Educational Leadership and Research Methodology, where he instructs courses for which contribute toward the progress of a Master of Education and Doctor of Philosophy degrees. Dr. Fairman is also a graduate of FAU's PhD program in Higher Education Leadership. As a complement to his professional responsibilities, Dr. Fairman serves as a board member and coach of SABRE, the Soccer Association for Boca Raton. Thank you for being here, and let's give it up for Dr. Fairman. Last but certainly not least, we have Mickey Caboose. Mickey. Mickey is the Chief Executive Officer of South Florida Tech Hub, one of the largest regional innovation organizations in the United States, focusing on Miami-Dade, Broward, Palm Beach, and Martin Counties. Before the start of this presentation, Mickey also humble bragged to me that they just expanded into the Treasure Coast last week, which is a huge accomplishment. Mickey strives to continue building South Florida's Tech Hub by connecting the community with the right resources in order to begin, or in order to bring growth to the region which spotlights us as a place of sustainable economic and business development. Mickey Caboose, thank you for being here and serving as one of our judges. Now that we got all the housekeeping items underway, we are going to get into the portion of the program that we've all been waiting for, the presentation of our graduate students in the three-minute thesis competition. Before we introduce our first competitor, I just want to give the cadence of how I'm going to introduce each competitor. That way they all get a raucous round of applause from this audience waiting on tenterhooks for your every word. I'm going to first introduce the speaker's name, then I'm going to describe which college they represent, then I'm going to deliver the title of their presentation. After that is when we can give a really nice round of applause for each of our competitors. Does that sound good? Woo! All right, let's give them one round of applause before they start. Our first competitor, Emmanuel McNeely from the Charles E. Schmidt College of Medicine. What does a surgeon look like? How stereotypes may negatively impact recruitment into the least diverse specialty in medicine. Marion Edelman coined the phrase, you can't be what you do not see. As a black underrepresented minority in medicine, I had a winding road to medical school. What is the underrepresented minority in medicine, you may ask? One whose ethnic and racial population in medicine is considerably less than that in the US population. I coupled my research and my love for community outreach diversity projects, and surgery to ask this important research question. Why are so few underrepresented minorities in medicine, particularly African Americans, pursuing the least diverse specialty in all of medicine, namely orthopedic surgery? Our <coughs> results were eye-opening, yet not shocking. We surveyed 30 undergraduate students from a top-rated institution we asked them their perceptions, their opinions, and their thoughts of orthopedic surgery. Here is what we found. Nearly half of our students had never encountered a Black or African American physician. Over half of these students had never encountered or met a Hispanic or Latinx physician. Yet 90% of our respondents, our students, had encountered or met a Caucasian or white physician. Interestingly, all underrepresented minority students had considered a career in medicine, yet only one considered orthopedic surgery. Why is this? 
We asked our respondents, if you could choose one gender and one racial ethnic background, how do you perceive an orthopedic surgeon? Almost all of our respondents said Caucasian or white. A vast majority of our, our respondents perceive an orthopedic surgeon to be a white male, and only one student perceived an orthopedic surgeon to be black or African American. Why is this important? Numerous studies have shown as we increase diversity, we help eliminate health disparities and we improve patient outcomes for all patients. Therefore, I have dedicated my career and my future research to increasing diversity at all levels, from pre-med to medical school, from residency to academic leadership. My wife and I founded a foundation where we have reached thousands of students, inspiring them, giving them resources, and teaching them, equipping them for what they need to overcome and become a physician. Why is this important? Because if we want to improve patient outcomes, we all must agree that increasing diversity is the way to do it. Thank you. We are now going to observe temporary silence while our judges finish populating their ballots. This is to ensure that they give every single competitor the same amount of attention. So we're going to wait until they're done and then announce the next competitor. Thank <laughs> you. Alrighty, we're going to go ahead and move on to our next competitor. Diana Fetterman from the College of Education, a critical content analysis of Fountas and Pinnell's LLI system. Learning how to read? Did it come easily to you? 
Did you have a favorite book or series? Or perhaps you had a completely different experience. Maybe you just never found that book, the one with the story that spoke to you. And why is finding that book so important? Well, research has shown that culturally relevant stories, those with characters that have a similar age, gender, a shared background, similar experiences, have benefits. For students, these benefits are increased reading proficiency and the social emotional benefits of seeing that their stories matter. So if we know that culturally relevant books are important, are they in our classrooms? That's what drives my research, especially when so many students are struggling to learn how to read. Here in Florida, on the latest state reading exam, 45% of elementary students were reading below satisfactory levels. It is aggregated by race, 48% of Hispanic students and 62% of black students were reading below this mark. Nationwide, the story isn't much better. And when that happens, students are placed into reading intervention programs. So what books are we using in those programs to reach our struggling readers? Well, one of the most prevalent series is LLI, used in all 50 states and four of the seven largest districts here in Florida. I am conducting a critical content analysis of the 732 stories within the first edition of LLI in order to determine how characters of color and their culture are represented. After reading these 732 stories, I eliminated from the sample all books that contained only animals, objects, and solely white characters. I was left with 298 books, 41%. Not exactly representative, not bad. Then I dug deeper. I further eliminated books from the sample if the characters of color appeared in the drawing or picture but were never actually mentioned in the text. They lacked agency. I was left with 165 books. 23 percent. 23 percent of the students of color are so overrepresented in our reading intervention program. And what do those 23 percent of books show? Characters of color are deceitful, foolish, and often in need of assistance, frequently from the white savior of the story. And this, in every state, in one of the most popular reading intervention programs we have. Our students deserve better, better quality, better representation than 23%. Another moment of silence for our judges.
It looks like we are about ready to move on to our next competitor. I'm going to introduce now Robin Jimenez Me from the College of Social Work and Criminal Justice. Perceptions of post traumatic growth among adults with lived experience in foster care. Imagine, it's your first day at college. You're sitting on your bed all by yourself as you watch your college roommate's parents come in and out of the room. You watch your college roommate's mom make her bed. You watch your father hang the items on the wall. And there you sit on your mattress, bare and naked. Because a couple of hours prior, your social worker had dropped you off with only two of the bags that you own, and none of that was petty. 10% prior research indicates um, 10% prior research indicates 10% of adults with lived experience in the foster care system attends college. And of that 10%, only 3% graduates. So I was curious, could those who have experienced trauma and abuse in foster care actually experience post-traumatic growth? Post-traumatic growth as um defined by post-traumatic growth researchers, Tedeschi and Calhoun, is defined as positive growth through crises or trauma. So we conducted an uh, exploratory research study here at Florida Atlantic University of adult college students who have been in the Florida foster care system to see what their perceptions and ideas were for those to experience growth and trauma, growth through trauma. And they came up with three themes. One being, when you have a supportive individual in your life, you can succeed. Two, nonprofit organizations that provide support and guidance and understanding, as well as a network of individuals who are there to understand what you have gone through. And three, informal and formal resources, which are those that are like social media, that are your friends, that are the waivers that we can get from um, educational institutions as well as here in the state of Florida. So future research has, my goal is, my goal for future research is to focus on rural and underserved areas do they experience growth through trauma? How about those who don't get to attend college when they've been in foster care? Do they experience post-traumatic growth? Because no matter what, no one deserves or asks to be in foster care. We all deserve academic success and future success. So thank you.
looks like we are nearly ready to call up our next competitor. Matthew Patterson from the Dorothy F. Schmidt College of Arts and Letters. A picture of resiliency. Students attending college while homeless. College is seen as a way out of poverty and homelessness, but unstable living conditions make college more difficult. My study uses photo boards to explore the experiences of students attending college while homeless and hopes that better understanding leads to better supports. I asked students to take photographs of anything they felt relevant to their experience attending college while homeless and then explain them to me in a one on one Zoom interview. Afterward, my colleague Dr. Grote and I analyzed the transcripts and the photos and identified four major themes trying to move forward feeling the need to hide, the duality of resources, and necessary supports. I've included an example of each. Starting on your left, trying to move forward. All the students felt college was their best way to improve their lives. And this student told me that she was in school now so that in the future, dinner didn't have to look like this for her and her daughter. Next, feeling the need to hide. This student took a photograph of her windshield on a rainy day. At the time, she lived in her car, it was during the COVID-19 shutdowns, and she told me she would park in the university's parking lot so she could use the school's Wi-Fi to attend her classes. All the students were resourceful. However, she also told me that every hour she would move her car across campus because she was afraid she'd be noticed. She was embarrassed she lived in her car. Worse, she was afraid that security might notice her and ask her to leave. It happened in other parking lots. This stigma had a broader impact, though, because all the students told me that at one point the school actually reached out and offered support but they were hesitant to say yes or to respond because they didn't want to be identified. To this point, only 50% actually were enrolled in supportive programs. Next, the duality of resources refers to situations where help actually came with it through difficulties. For example, this student was gifted furniture and other supplies by a supportive family member, but since she had nowhere to live, she had to buy a storage unit, and now she told me it's frustrating because she has to pay for it and she can't even use it. Finally, necessary supports. These were identified needs, and of course, housing was number one. So this student took a photograph of her new keys. Thanks to financial aid and the supportive program, she was finally able to move into a dorm room. She told me this was her first set of keys, and she was very proud. Other identified needs were food assistance, transportation assistance, access to a washer and dryer on campus for laundry services. All the students had at least one photograph with laundry shoved into a backpack or scrolled across the back of their car. And the dirty clothes contributes to that stigma of homelessness. These little things we could do. I also identified counseling because 50% of the participants, again, had experienced childhood homelessness, which is a unique form of trauma. Finally, persistent and supportive outreach. As I said, only 50% of the students were engaged in programs and they didn't do so on the first offer, but once they were engaged, they got relief and they said that they stuck around because they felt supported. Thank you. Let's all the sounds for our judges.
Okay, we are ready to move on to our next competitor. Megan Hanley from the Dorothy F. Schmidt College of Arts and Letters. Feeling flow and expressing emotions while improvising. Music therapy and music professor perspectives. What if I were to ask you to come up on stage and give a speech on the spot without preparation right now? Are you feeling some hesitancy or maybe even some anxiety? This is what a lot of musicians feel when improvising or creating original music on the spot. Improvisation is used in genres from classical to jazz to hip hop and rap. It's also used by music therapists to help with client self-expression and improve positive social interactions. My question was then, how does improvisation vary from a music therapy clinical setting to a piano lesson setting. What are the things that therapists and professors value in the improvisation themselves? And how do the activities that they lead reflect these values? I interviewed four music therapists and four piano professors across the US. And I chose interviewees who had a variety of settings and clients and students. For example, music therapists worked in everywhere from hospitals to memory care facilities to schools. Likewise, piano professors worked with all ages, from elementary all the way up to college level. And across interviews, I found that they valued two things the most. They were emotional expression and feeling flow, or feeling confidence and security and focus while improvising. Despite these common values, they actually have very different activities. Piano professors mostly focus on compositional activities teaching students what notes sound good together and what are some common music patterns. In contrast, music therapists focus on activities with these values. To help with emotional expression, they encourage clients to improvise on personal memories. To help with flow, they taught clients exercises like deep breathing for relaxation. Likewise, they were more likely to verbally process the improvisation experience itself, what the clients were thinking and what they were feeling while playing their instrument. There's not a lot of material on these valued areas of expression and flow when you look at current improvisation pedagogy publications. More research is needed. Not just so musicians can be fancy and dazzle their audiences faster, but also to make the experience of learning improvisation less stressful. You know, there's so many benefits for improvisation beyond just the musical. It can help with problem solving and be an outlet for emotional expression. It encourages flexibility and confidence. More research is needed to make this accessible to musicians of all ages and levels. And the future of it might be in music therapy research. Thank you. I think you know the drill by now. One minute of silence or a moment of silence for our judges. <clears throat> Okay, we are going to move to our next competitor.
Marjorie Patterson from the Dorothy F. Schmidt College of Arts and Letters. The influence of nature, poetry, and contemporary techniques in the music of John Byrd. I ask you to think of three words when you hear the name Canada, what might come to mind? Cold, hockey, maple syrup? Well, I can either confirm or deny these claims. I can say that Canada has a very diverse, unique musical voice. The first European music was heard in Canada in 1534 when the explorer Jacques Cartier landed in the New World and had the mass sung. Over the next 500 years, Music was heard in the metropolitan centers in the east in Montreal, Quebec, moving through the Prairie provinces and reaching the west coast of Vancouver. John Byrd builds on these traditions. Born in 1961 in Dryden, Ontario, Byrd soon discovered a passion for music. He went on to study composition with renowned musicologist and composer John Beckwith. Byrd now works as a professor and composer at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. In my research, I interviewed the composer and studied his compositions to better understand his style. When asked about his artistic values, Berg noted that he wanted to write music that was only as difficult as it needs to be. As a performer, I thank him. Was to write music that generates an emotional response to the listener and performer, and was to use his power of position and authority to better the world for the next generation of artists. When looking at his compositions, I specifically focused on piano ones, being a piano pianist myself, and found three main compositional influences. Those were the influence of nature, poetry, and extended or contemporary piano techniques. We Canadians have a close connection with nature, and we love our two seasons of July and winter. <laughs> Berg taps into this passion for nature with the programmatic titling of many of his works. For example, his prelude Hummingbird has a pianist play a flurry of notes up and down the keys to imitate the sound of a bird. The second influence, the influence of poetry, is Berg's most prominent. Berg recently just completed a fifth set of studies of poetry, where he sets pieces to poems by various poets, many of whom are Canadian, such as his friend Helen Humphrey and Margaret Avision. The last technique, extended piano techniques, is always used in conjunction with some sort of image or emotion he's trying to create. For example, his prelude, Bells of the Winter, has a pianist press the pedal with their right foot, take their left hand, and strike the low string on the piano. If done properly, the sound will reverberate and sound like a church bell across the barren landscape. John Berg's continual work as a composer and teacher demonstrate the unique musical voice of Canada. Thank you. You guessed it, not a moment of silence.
Okay, we are now going to advance to our next competitor. Megan Spring from the Dorothy F. Schmidt College of Arts and Letters. American Possession, Ghost Floor in Toni Morrison's Beloved. I have this distinct childhood memory. It's cold out, my grandfather sets me a campfire, and he invites us all to sit around it. He told a ghost story, and for the life of me, I cannot remember what this ghost story was about, but I remember being utterly terrified. And so I approached him afterward and I said, Grandpa, is that story true? Was it real? And he looked at me with the kindest eyes and he said, Absolutely, it was. Much to the chagrin of my parents, whose bed I crawled in for nights after. But it wouldn't be until years later that I realized. He was telling me the truth because what are ghosts? Ghosts are simultaneously fixtures of the past, but very much alive in the present, transcending time and space. And what are hauntings about the traumas and fears and anxieties of a people and a culture? And so, analysis of ghost stories provides insights into those peoples and cultures, which leads me to Toni Morrison's Beloved, a novel set in the late 1800s that chronicles the lives of a black family post Civil War from slavery. It's a microcosm of my research, a ghost story in which Morrison uses a fantastically unique word for ghost. The word haint originates with the Gullah people, an amalgamation of African cultures enslaved by plantation owners. And the Gullah believed a haint to be an evil spirit that entered the house at night to possess God and the soul of the inhabitants. Now, they also believed that a haint could not cross water, so in an effort to protect themselves, they painted their porch ceilings shades of blue, shades of the ocean. Now, plantation owners adopted this ritual because at the time, the color blue was created using the indigo crop, a notoriously difficult crop to both harvest and sow. And so, blue porch ceilings became symbols of wealth and status. Now, at this time, the United States produced most of the world's indigo, so that the legalization of slavery in Georgia is actually directly linked to the indigo trade. Now, in essence, the commodification of this Gullah ritual further entrenched the Gullah people in slavery. So we can't really separate the color of paint from the ghost story from the burgeoning wealth of the United States of America. Now, according to American mythos, possession is freedom. According to the American dream, ownership, especially through land, is the epitome of freedom. However, the word possession connotes the opposite. And so when Morrison uses the word hate, she's drawing our attention to the idea that perhaps African American cultures view the ideal of possession differently than other American cultures. So why is this important? Storytelling reveals the uncanniness of our lives, and just like Morrison's use of the ghost story provides insight into how perhaps African American cultures may look at the American dream differently, analysis of other ghost stories provides insights into other identities within the larger American identity. Because when we understand someone's fears, we understand the breeds and empathy that will allow us to exercise our ghosts as a nation. Thank you.
We are ready for our next competitor. Ingrid Santian Baragan from the College of Engineering and Computer Science. Corrosion is in the air. Most structures are honest, are designed to last for 50 years. While it's well known that structures can stand for longer than that, in Florida, they are exposed to harsh marine environment that can instead decrease in that time. Structures like bridges are made of reinforced concrete that has embedded steel. Concrete has an alkaline nature that promotes a healthy environment for the embedded steel. However, concrete is also a porous medium. This, when exposed to marine environment, means that the particles present in the air will deposit in this force. Reinforced concrete structures in Florida will face a common challenge, corrosion. Corrosion is an electrochemical process that affects the steel. The result of that is called rust. Now, technically, corrosion is not really in the air. Marine aerosols that contain chlorides are in the air. They generate in the ocean through different mechanisms, such as wave crashing. They travel with the wind and they deposit in the surface of concrete structures. Then they penetrate through the concrete pores until they reach the steel, and that is how corrosion is initiated. Structures are exposed to five different corrosion zones, with the splash zone being the one that has the highest corrosion rates. However, in Florida, it has been observed in bridges that are facing the ocean, but corrosion has been in the atmospheric zone, the one above the splash zone. Therefore, the main objective of my research is to investigate the causes of corrosion at the atmospheric zone in bridges exposed to the ocean. Samples were taken from three different Florida bridges, concrete scores were extracted from the columns in the bridge, and then they were analyzed to measure the amount of chlorides that have penetrated through the years. Another goal of this research is also to measure the environmental data to a test called the wet handle test. This test allows to measure the salinity in the air by measuring the amount of products present in the environment. Samples were taken monthly through over a year. Now we have two sets of experimental data, samples from the bridge and samples from the web handle. While correlating these results, we are able to observe the trends of how the chlorides penetrate in concrete bridges around Florida. Understanding the corrosion in different areas in Florida on these bridges will allow us to impact the design and also the service life of the structures around Florida by promoting cost-effective, also safer, and overall better design bridges. So the next time you are planning to go to the bridge, you will cross the intercoastal bridges, having your mind that corrosion is in the air. <laughs> <laughs> We will now move to our next competitor, Dominic Gold 
from the Charles E. Schmidt College of Science. Homomorphic encryption will save the world and your privacy. Let me read you a story. It's eight night, and you have a hot date, and you're here dressed to impress. You unlock your phone using your face, your facial recognition or fingerprint data. You look at the nicest restaurant on the Maps app, and maybe get some chocolate or flowers to your home dress. Unfortunately for you, your hot date turns out to be quite the tech savvy stalker. Not only that. They're also the CEO of the company responsible for making your phone and its accompanying apps. This date gone wrong now has access to all of your information, your fingerprint, your face, your home address, and your current location. Look, you can't prevent them from accessing this data. You're the CEO after all. But what you can do is make all of this private information uninterpretable by encrypting all of it first. Yet, that would mean that the server performing all the computations needs to find the nicest restaurant based off an encrypted location, unlock your phone based off an encrypted face, uh, face or fingerprint, send flowers to an encrypted address. There is no reason to believe it's possible to do all of these things on data that is so sensitive that it can't be handled. Or is there? Is there a way to do all of these seemingly impossible feats on encrypted data. My research answers this question with a technique of cryptography known as homomorphic encryption. Homomorphic encryption enables even the most complicated of computer tasks to be performed on encrypted data. Because the data is never directly handled or seen by the computer, it ensures user privacy while still outputting the desired answer as if the data was never encrypted in the first place. For example, I was able to implement the steps needed to enable secure AI for prediction and classification on encrypted data. But that was just the beginning, as I was also able to classify an encrypted object into one of three distinct shapes with near 100% accuracy. There's a branch of data science known as topological data analysis, TD for short, that uses these structural differences alone to create powerful computer models. My research lives at the intersection of these two disciplines. I was able to get the shape of data without ever revealing the underlying data underneath. The ultimate goal of this research then is to combine both communities of the TDA and cryptography communities into the field of encrypted data science to progress both society and the sciences while also protecting our privacy. So the next time you have a date, don't feel free to do anything different. Take them out to a nice restaurant, get some flowers, and have a good time. But make sure your hot dates and get a hold of your even hotter dates up. And be sure to encrypt it first. Thank you. <laughs> Now for our next 
competitor. Amish Mishra from the Charles E. Schmidt College of Science. So, you want to build the protein? Imagine with me. You wake up on Sunday morning, ready to satiate your hunger. You heat a pan and crack an egg right into that pool of creamy, bubbling butter. Breakfast is served with a beautiful yolk and perfect egg white. But did you ever wonder what makes your egg white turn light? Today, I'm going to show you how the answer to that question opens a doorway of investigation to the very atoms of our universe. Egg white has a protein called albumin. You can think of it like a string of atoms that's wrapped and folded around itself in a very precise and complex way. When you heat the egg white, that protein structure falls apart. They link together like a net and give the egg that all familiar white color. Now, I use this as an example to illustrate a profound point. The structure of a protein determines the sorts of properties that protein exhibits. In the case of egg whites, the structure determines the color. And proteins are pretty much in everything. They're in your saliva and your stomach, helping you digest food. They're antibodies serving on the front lines to defend your body. And now scientists are able to design their own sequence of atoms to manufacture proteins that have never been seen before. But there's a challenge. Protein stability. You see, generally a protein that falls apart and cannot go back to its original state is called unstable. Just think of the proteins in the egg white. They cannot go back to the way they used to be once heated up. So if we're going to design our own proteins, we need a better understanding of their structural properties. Simply put, what is it about the structure of a protein that makes it work? And that is where my research comes in. My thesis treats the atoms in the protein like data points and takes a data-driven approach to investigate the role of structure in protein stability. I've obtained information on thousands of proteins built and manufactured in a lab in the University of Washington. Using a powerful tool of math called topological data analysis, I've measured the holes and gaps between the atoms. Our preliminary results show that smaller spaces and gaps correspond to more stable proteins. Critical knowledge like this in hand with AI can advance drug development and advance the creation of stable proteins. That means if you can simulate what your protein looks like on a computer, we can determine if that protein has potential to be useful. The future applications of this work go into tackling diseases and creating new drugs. My dissertation work reveals just a little glimpse into the beautifully intricate world that God has spoken into existence. Collecting data and analyzing it offers a direct way for researchers like me to investigate this winter wonderland of complexity. So, do you want to build a protein? Come on, let's go and play. Yes, it's on the silence. Our next competitor, Morgan Slevin from the Charles E. Schmidt College of Science. What's up your gut? Solving mysteries of the avian gut microbiome.
it's what's inside that counts. So I'll show you what science cover. We've all been raised on these little mantras, but I built my dissertation around it. You see, almost every living thing, including me, is home to millions of bacterial cells living in and on the various parts of our bodies, forming communities called microbiomes. The gut microbiome, researchers have found this community in your gut regulates gut health, but also aspects of your brain, including behavior and even cognitive ability. So humans are interested in studying animal microbiomes to model these relationships with human health. I'm more interested in studying animal microbiomes with the animal state because these communities can explain variation in individual animal survival and even behavior response to environmental change, like urbanization or global climate change, which are only going to get worse with time. So for my dissertation, I am studying the understudy, bird bacteria. My goal is to understand how a bird's gut microbiome relates to and may actually influence its brain. First, I sample the gut microbiome of our captive population of zebra finches to figure out what's up there. And then I measured their performance on various cognitive tasks. And I found that birds that solve these tasks faster, they have different microbiome characteristics than those that solve them more slowly. And my slower solvers had a relatively higher pathogen abundance. So cool. What does that mean? Were my smart birds smarter because of the microbiome? It turns out stress is a big mediator in this gut brain relationship because it impacts cognitive performance negatively, which we have all those, but it also contributes to the immune response, spelling trouble for the microbiome. So maybe my dumb birds are actually just more stressed out. So my next step was to test the impact of stress on the health and microbiome of a wild population of northern corn. And I found that birds with a more diverse gut microbiome were healthier, better body condition, lower baseline stress hormone levels, and even a less dramatic stress response. And they were sexier, having more elaborate vegan feather coloration used in sexual orientation in the species, showing that beauty really is more than skin deep. Because it's tough to measure cognition in a wild population, I am now back in the lab for my final experiment, again with my captive zebra fish population. Testing the impacts of a well validated stress treatment, extended social isolation. Now, I'm testing the impacts of that on your gut microbiome, sexual orientation, and cognitive performance. And zebra finches are like us, they're social species, just like humans. So, we humans know from my time during COVID that extended social isolation from uh, quarantine can be very, very difficult. Not a lot of fun, right? The world is full of stressful situations, whether it's the traffic on I 95 or this competition and understanding the impacts that stress has on those those most important to us can really have a lasting impact. So inside and out. One more sounds. Future friends, you can love her. <laughs> we'll now move to the next competitor, Kayla O'Brien from the Charles E. Schmidt College of Science. Microplastics in mangrove and beach sediments on Southeast Florida barrier islands.
They emulate over 380 million tons of plastic is produced. 10 million tons end up in our oceans every year. Microplastics are described as being less than five millimeters in length. For size reference, the end of an eraser on a pencil is usually about five millimeters across. Microplastics end the marine environment through stormwater, wastewater, recreational and industrial activities, and through you know, improper disposal of a variety of different plastic products. Microplastics are a problem because they can absorb and concentrate persistent organic pollutants. They can also be colonized by potentially harmful algae and microorganisms. They can transfer across trophic levels and bioaccumulate. And for some organisms, ingestion of microplastics can lead to reduced survival, development, reproduction, and even death. Humans are also impacted by microplastic pollution. Recent studies have documented plastic particle pollution in human blood and tissues. And it's also been estimated that humans are ingesting upwards of five grams of plastic every week, which is equivalent to the weight of a credit card. Florida's coastal systems are at, are at high risk for microplastic pollution. Increases in population and urbanization lead to an increase of plastic waste ending up in our coastal communities. For my thesis research, I'm, my aim is to quantify the abundance and variation of microplastics in mangrove and beach sediments on Southeast Florida barrier islands, which are important um, coastal ecosystems. Barrier islands serve as a unique study area because they are a transition zone before, between our upland and our um, marine habitats. There have been no studies or monitoring efforts looking at microplastic pollution in Southeast Florida Barrier Island sediments or comparing um, geomorphic properties of the area on microplastic accumulation. For my study, I selected three study sites throughout Palm Beach County, Florida and sampled them in the summer and winter of 2022. From each site, we selected sediments, we collected sediment samples from the back barrier, mangrove, shoreline, and the open coast beach. The sediment, the sediment samples and microplastic samples are still um, being analyzed, but we do have some preliminary results that show a range of 190 to 380 microplastic pieces per kilogram dry weight of sediment, with microplastic fibers making up 95% of the microplastics identified so far. The results of this research will be important for coastal managers to better understand current microplastic pollution conditions to inform best management and conservation practices. Thank you. We will now move to our next competitor, Margaret Rodriguez from the Charles E. Schmidt College of Science. Ichthyoplankton recruitment within mangrove dominated mosquito control impoundments. Coastal wetlands particularly mangroves, provide essential nursery habitat to hundreds of fish within the Indian River Lagoon alone. 
However, in the 1950s and 60s, much of these salt marsh and mangrove wetlands were impounded for mosquito control purposes. Unlike freshwater mosquitoes, salt marsh mosquitoes breed in moist soil, which is exposed during hot summer months. So as we can see in the diagram to the left, the far right, that's one of my impoundment sites. And so you can see there's a dike around the outer edge of the mangroves, and then within the dike, there are ditches which are periodically filled with water to inhibit these mosquitoes from laying their eggs. However, in the 70s and 80s, they realized that because of the um, closed off of the uh, outer dikes, fish, as well as proper water connectivity, is inhibited. So they implemented uh, special metal culverts, which uh, are fish tunnels. So fish are able to move in and out. So for my research, I am looking at larval fish abundance, or ichthyoplankton abundance, within three Indian River land trust sites along the east coast of Florida. And so in order to sample these fish larvae, I use what is called light traps. And so in the middle picture, you can see that's one of my light traps. And I set three on the inside of each impoundment and three in the outer lagoon. And you can see that there are many intake funnels that taper down to a collection jar at the bottom. And there's a light inside that attracts the fish essentially like moths. And so each time I set and each time I retrieve these traps, I also take dissolved oxygen as well as salinity measurements. After I collect my fish, I humanely euthanize them and I preserve them in a 37% formaldehyde solution for identification. I use a digital microscope and I look at identifying characteristics such as the number of fin rays, the number of myomeres or muscle uh, bands, as well as pigmentation to get a proper identification. So for my, uh, uh, data so far, we can see that the most abundant species on the top was the eastern mosquito fish, followed by the bay anchovy. My two target species, the common snook and the Atlantic tarpon, which are popular sport fish game species, had much lower abundances. So, uh, along with these data, I'm using the data from station water level and temperature sensors to look at the differences in seasonality as well as the differences inside the impoundments and the surrounding lagoon. My data can be used by the Indian River Land Trust as well as the Indian River Lagoon National Estuary Program to build better management plants and then to um, elicit that information to mosquito control districts across the east coast of Florida. So while we're keeping the mosquitoes at bay, hopefully we can keep our local fish residents happy as well. Thank you. Our next competitor, Abigail Blackburn from the Charles E. Schmidt College of Science. Bioluminescence of the Tina 4 Nemeopsis labii. largest interspecies communication system on our planet. It's been absolutely beautiful. <laughs> it's something that I've been obsessed with ever since I was little. And in each species, it can be very, very different. It's species specific. The 
wavelengths, how long it flashes, how much flashes, so many different things. And a lot of this has been characterized by xenoplasmids or small phytoplankton. They have a very small flash peak with a um, short drive time and a short decay. It's one flash and it's simulated through um, mechanical stimulation, so some sort of water movement that's causing them to be messed up. <laughs> um, anyway, I'm trying to look at something a little bit more complex than that. A multicellular uh, organism called a teniform. It's kind of like a jellyfish, but um, there's that distinction between the variants and tenophora, and the tenophora basically just doesn't stay. So they're nice. <laughs> yeah. um, they buy the nest along their team rows. They have eight of them all along their body. They're really beautiful. They're like little paddles. They refract light and cause this rainbow effect in the sun. And when they're stimulated at night, they create that uh, greenish, bluish bioluminescence. And I'm trying to quantify their flash kinetics, that specific flash that they make, their own signature, their voice, whatever you want to call it. But um, Anyway, uh, I'm using a couple different methods to do this because it's pretty new. So one of the methods I'm doing is using a UVAP, which is an underwater bioluminescent assessment tool. It's like a small vacuum cleaner that you put in the water. It sucks up water and simulates them in a turbulent flow, mixes them around, and collects that light from the photons through a PMT. I'm also looking at another more quantifiable integrating sphere, which is basically just a white ball that light can bounce off of, and it gives me the total mechanical stimulated light. And then I'm comparing both of those methods together. I'm also looking at their shear stress threshold, which is that minimum amount of pressure needed to get them to glow. It's like, what poke do I need to get you to just show me the light? And I'm doing that with the scientifics. So scientifics are the larval form of the tenophores that I'm um, studying. I've learned through many trials and tribulations how to culture them, and um, I'm mostly, mostly focusing with them. So I spawn them in the night, I collect them from the Indian River Lagoon, and I uh, use their offspring, and then I release them after they have been Thank you. Sorry. We'll now move to our next competitor, Haley Knapp from the Charles E. Schmidt College of Science. From poop to parents, examining paternity in dynamic Atlantic spotted dolphin populations in the Bahamas. study dolphin food. What can it tell us? Turns out, quite a bit. 
You see, your poop contains cells that have been shed by your intestines, and those cells contain DNA. The same is true for dolphins. This non-invasively collected DNA can then be used to tell us things like the paternity of each individual. So with the help of the Wild Dolphin Project, I am studying the genetics of Atlantic spotted dolphins. The Wild Dolphin Project has been studying spotted in the Bahamas for nearly four decades. But in 2013, on one of their trips to Little Bahama Bank, they couldn't find them. After a month of searching and over 160 kilometers south, we finally found the dolphins on Great Bahama Bank, where they also found a second population of spotted. This exodus presents a unique opportunity to learn how two populations interact after being thrown together because of an ecosystem crash. And that's where I come in. By extracting, isolating, and amplifying the DNA from fecal samples, I am examining the short, repetitive DNA sequences called microsatellites. These microsatellites are then used to look at paternity, so we know which males are successful in firing offspring. This is important because dolphins are very promiscuous creatures. They will mate with whomever they want, whenever they want. Because the two populations are now sharing the same habitat, there's an increased opportunity for mating, which means increased gene flow and genetic diversity. Recently, the Wild Dolphin Project discovered that the two previously aggressive and hostile populations are now socially merging. And because they have observed courtship among individuals from both groups, it is expected that my results will demonstrate a genetic mixing that is driven by the males who are encouraging these social interactions. This is important because as climate change continues to drive populations to migrate, social interactions will increase. And if they're genetically mixing, they're more likely to survive. So even though no one likes to talk about poop, it can tell us a lot about dolphins. Thank you. Moving ahead to our next competitor, Don Raja Som from the Charles E. Schmidt College of Science. With every fiber characterizing biomineral ultrastructure and nanomechanical properties of shark vertebrae. looks like? That's a shark. <laughs> Great. Um, but what does a shark really look like on the inside? And how does that affect how it swims? Sharks are made of cartilage. We have cartilage too, in our ears, our nose, our knees. But a shark's skeleton is all cartilage. And its vertebral column is especially important in how it swims and steers and springs into action. I'm a chemist, so I'm going to use a chemist's approach to dissection. If I were to strip shark cartilage for parts, or examine its chemical makeup, which is what I do, I find that it has mineral, collagen, and sugars. The mineral, hydroxyapatite, is the same thing that makes our bones and teeth hard. Collagen is a protein that comes in fibers. You might know it from our hair or skin. I'm interested in these very molecules that make up shark cartilage. Um, how are they arranged? How do they interact with each other? 
and how exactly do they make a difference in how well sharks swim? I explore these ideas with powerful microscopes. I get to use lasers, electrons, x rays, all sorts of things. Um, I can collect x rays at several different angles, like you would with a CT scanner at a doctor's office, except with nano CT, you use a big instrument, you go big, um, to, you, to look at very tiny details like how the mineral and collagen interact with each other. Cartilage is pretty flexible. To find out just how flexible shark cartilage is, I poke it with a tiny probe, and I look at it to see how the structure conforms as a result of this change. I can also cut the cartilage into very thin slices, um, thinner than one one thousandth of a hair's breadth, and then I send electrons flying through them. And how these electrons behave give me an idea about how the atoms are arranged within these fibers. Um, I want to compare these details between different sharks. For instance, our uh, black fifth over here, and also the fastest shark, the mako. Uh, what we found so far is that the mako's non-mineralized portion in its vertebrae is more ordered and also deforms more, which we think has implications in why it's such a good swimmer. Sharks have been around for hundreds of millions of years. They know a thing or two about being flexible. We can learn from them and their expert swimming prowess to apply solutions that are by inspired for problems that we have. For instance, we can use what we know in tissue engineering treatments um, for bone and joint diseases like osteoarthritis. We can also use what we know to make strong and flexible materials that are multi-composite materials for applications and say for ring robots. With every fiber of shark cartilage that we look at, we learn so much about what makes them powerful swimmers and we're all the better for it. Thank you so much. Um, sound, Moving along with our next competitor, Ivana Sara from the Charles E. Schmidt College of Science. Turtle life in and with a bony shield where biomechanics meets behavior. Between two plates 
and then slowly squeezing down on it. And by doing this at a constant rate and force, I'm able to measure how much energy they absorb, how much they deform, and how strong they are. Now, what I've seen so far across multiple turtle species is that even though the shell is very strong, it's also very flexible, more than we would have ever thought. Now, what this tells us is that it's well adapted for multiple different functions. So on one hand, it can be strong like a coat of armor, and on the other, it can be very flexible when it needs to be. So to give you an example of this, sea turtles are constantly diving to great depths. The deeper the dive, the more pressure they're going to feel. So that's when flexibility is going to be important. If you want to know what that would feel like, it's about 120 pounds of force weighing down on you every square inch. Now, hopefully I've convinced you that sea turtles and their shells are really remarkable, but unfortunately turtles are now facing new threats that they're not so well adapted for, including boat strikes. At high speeds, a boat colliding with a turtle can cause significant damage to the shell, and it can be fatal. I hope that by better understanding how the shell responds to force, we can then better understand how the shell will respond to a boat strike. From there, we can make more informed management decisions regarding boats and turtles, so that they can stick around for another 100 million years. Thank you. Our next competitor, Hans Donzenbach, Disentangling from Charles E. Schmidt College of Science. Disentangling relationships between ornamentation and non-primary vocalizations in near-threatened song in near-threatened songbird, the Bachman Sparrow. Has a professional wrestler ever tried to make a fight with you? I mean, if they did, do you stand up and fight them or would you run away? I mean, like, I mean, I personally would run away. Some animals develop certain parts of their body in order to intimidate others out of competing for the same resources, you know, such as shelter, food, potential mates. Some of these features, like the antlers of a moose, they seem like silly distractions. But if you think about it, these features are a way for these animals to interact with other competitors. Hey, did you see how healthy and fit I am? I could put up a fight. Bring it, buddy. Birds use a combination of brightly colored feathers and song to indicate their fitness and fighting ability. Brightly colored feathers are a great indicator of fitness because a bird gets brightly colored plumage from eating the high quality food that it gets. Song is another great indicator of fitness. Imagine having to sing for five hours straight without losing your breath. Sounds like a very difficult task. And in addition to that, some songs are more difficult to sing over others, and males vary greatly of how well they can perform these songs. So we know that birds sing songs to attract mates and defend their territories, but do we know if they sing certain types of songs to intimidate their rivals? Think of a bird's vocal athleticism and say a professional wrestler's big muscles. A professional wrestler is going to flex his huge biceps to try to intimidate me, while the bird is going to sing his most physically challenging song. I study a species of bird called the Bachman Sparrow. Now, during the breeding season, the Bachman Sparrow sings regular songs to attract the mate of the defendant's territory. But when males square out to compete against each other, they sing a distinctively different type of song called a complex song. 
Understanding the social role that complex song plays will be essential to understanding how elaborate vocal communication systems have evolved. I hypothesize that complex songs contain information of the singer's health and fighting ability, which is why we see the song sung so often during male to male aggressive interactions. So, my plan this summer is to catch dozens of walking sparrows, take pictures of these beautiful yellow uh, patches of feathers that they have on their shoulders, take some body size measurements, record the complex songs that they're singing, and finally determine if the birds with the brightest, most yellowest patches of feathers that they have on their shoulder also sing the most elaborate complex songs. So, we know that birds sing songs to intimidate rivals, but we don't always know what features of songs are used. Or during intimidation. My study will tackle this question. So the next time you see a beautiful bird singing this beautiful melody, think of which of your favorite pro wrestler the most closely resembles to. Let's give it up one more time for all of our competitors. I personally have gained so much since listening to you today, and thank you for expressing that to this audience today. I do not envy our judges at all with making these tough decisions, but I want to empower all of the people in the audience right now because we are going to do right now the people's choice voting. How this is going to work is we are going to display a QR code of a survey. Remember, take into account the comprehension and content, engagement of communication, but you don't have to do the full rankings. You are just going to pick one of the competitors that you believe is the people's choice winner for this event. The QR code will be displayed on both screens, and we're only going to allow the vote to be for a total of three minutes to those that are here with us right now. Jonathan, go ahead and cue the clock. Get out your phones, everybody, if you want to vote. You may need to actually get up to get closer to the screen if you can't hit it, but let's cue our vote. People's choice, the people are going to speak. Everyone here in attendance, please go ahead and vote. <laughs> If anyone is having technical difficulties, let us know and somebody from graduate college will be around to help you. Okay, it looks like everyone here has snapped the picture of the QR code. So I'm going to cut this early because I have the microphone right now and I can do things like that. Jonathan, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> 
The People's Choice vote has concluded. Thank you so much. We will announce the winners momentarily as we get the tabulation of votes completed. I would like to introduce the interim dean of the Graduate College, Bill Calise, to say some words. Will everyone give it up for Dean Calise. especially wanted to recognize the awesome team of graduate college staff who over the past few weeks put in a lot of time and effort to make this event so successful. And I appreciate your efforts and I'd like to give them all a round of applause. For you. Thank you all very much for coming tonight. We're almost ready with the results. I want to say a few additional things. Every competitor that arrived here today to deliver their presentation for the second time, they either received one of the awards that you see on the screen here for each of the heats. So each of our competitors, as long as they were the first place, runner-up, second runner-up, and or People's Choice Award, they were invited to participate here today. Therefore, every single one of you are already winners. I know that's corny, but you really are. Through the old material that I had, I'm going to have to dip, dip deep in my pockets now for a little bit more. But we're trying to build the suspense here anyway, right? I mean, this is the time where we have to a commercial break. Thank you to our sponsors. Florida Atlantic University, thank you. For the facilities and, you know, the memories. Can't, can't deny it. For those of you that had a good time here, maybe we can show the post-event survey link right now, Jonathan. Do we still have that? Even though we haven't given you the results yet, we do want your feedback on the event in general. We encourage anyone that has attended today, please scan this QR code, give us your feedback. Let us know what went well. Let us know any room for improvement for the future. Because like I mentioned, we want to have the three-minute thesis every single year and see our graduate students in action and provide that forum for them. Any improvements that we can make at all for any of the heats of the championship, we will definitely take that into account and make that a reality for the future. The $20 that I have to owe David. <laughs> no more snapping, David. I told you $20, that was it, that was the limit. I'm gonna look over at where the judge tabulation is, is happening. I am proud of the time that we're at right now. I was a little, you know, a little nervous that maybe we'd exceed our time limit, but we look like we're going to do this right on time. I also wanted to note to all of our graduate student competitors to please hang around once the event has officially concluded. I'd love to get group photos on the stage uh, in a variety of ways. And we have a lot of backdrops or step and repeats, they're called, out in the lobby during the reception. So there's a lot of opportunity for us to take photos, capture more memories. And I just recommend that none of you leave because we are definitely going to use the great photo of all of you together in future marketing and that's kind of what I do here so <laughs> please don't go because I don't want to have to photoshop you into the group photo but if I have to I will because the show must go on speaking of the show I'm going to announce the winners soon I am first going to announce the second runner-up then I'm going to announce the first runner-up then I'm going to announce the people's choice award winner so that you will all be in grand suspense of our champion I can proudly proclaim that none of you were disqualified because of time, so there's that. Good up for you for making the, making the three minutes. This was all part of the program. We practiced this. This is how we're going to huddle awkwardly in front of everybody. Okay. I'm now going to announce the winner. We're going to take a photo of the uh, each recipient. We'll be up here. I'll hand them the order. 
piece. Maybe we can have you for the photo, and I know for the, our champion, we have a very special dignitary that's going to be here for the championship. So, is that okay with you? All right, let's get our team back on the stage. Zeke Khalif, right here. You're going to do the second run up. Look at this acrylic. Here we go. Okay. We have our second runner up. Please, everyone, give a really great round of applause for the second runner up of our 2023 three minute thesis competition, Emmanuel McNeely. <laughs> Lights up the room, and then you'll. I'm jealous. Now, for our first runner up, Amish Mishra. Choice Award recipient, Amish Mishra. Amish Mishra. Amish Mishra. special individual that I'm going to call up to the stage. First, I want to just say that our championship award is sponsored in perpetuity thanks to the Dr. Eric H. Shaw 3MT Championship Award Endowment Fund, enabling a competition like this to continue year after year. Dr. Shaw, I'd love for you to come up on the stage for this presentation. Instance. There's actually a tie for first, which means we have two winners, which is pretty darn cool. I'm going to introduce the first, and then let's give the same recognition to the second. Okay, so I did spoil it. There's a tie, but there is a tie. One of our championship winners, and again, the recipient of the Dr. Eric H. Shaw 3MT Championship Award, which is sponsored in perpetuity, Haley Knapp. Stand to the side, we're going to get another photo with the other first place winner, and then a group photo all together, right? Right, this up as we go. Our other winner, 3MT Championship, of the Dr. Eric H. Shaw 3MT Championship Award, Ingrid Santian Baragon.
Congratulations again. And our dignitaries, we're going to take more photos after. I shouldn't be holding this. Up. There's a lot of pressure there, uh, a ton of pressure. We just want to congratulate again everyone for competing in this event right now. Another huge round of applause. And we usually close out our winners will advance to the Conference of Florida Graduate Schools in April, which is going to be held at the University of Miami. We are going to cheer on our Florida Atlantic winners of this year's 3MT graduate. That officially concludes the event. Again, if you had competed in this event, if you were a faculty advisor or a dignitary of any sort, please hang around. We're going to take some really fabulous photos. There are drinks and refreshments in the lobby as well for everyone to enjoy the reception. But again, thank you for being here. This was a wonderful event.